All right, so let's go around and be looking at Canadians change when they hear the word war. Yeah, it's hard to be interesting. Let's take a look at it, shall we? Sorry, not sorry. While Canadians are nowadays subject to the stereotype of hockey-loving, maple syrup-chugging, overly polite potheads, their wartime stereotypes in the First and Second World Wars had their enemies trembling in their boots and making a hot mess in their trousers. It's as if, when the Canadians hear the word war, their insatiable desire for maple syrup and Canadian beer turns into an insatiable desire for blood. In saying that, however, they didn't always rush enemy positions with bayonets, meat cleavers, and spiked clubs, but were some of the most well-trained and Wait, form- meat cleavers? What? Hold on. <laughs> the bayonets, I understand. That's a, that's a fix to the end of the weapon, but... Meat cleavers? And spiked clubs. So they, they go medieval. Formidable soldiers on any front in any war. In this video, we're going to explore Canadian wartime reputation, keeping our scope focused on World War II and the heroic feats of individual Canadian soldiers therein. To get the puck sliding, let's move our scope quickly to the First World War, in which the Canadians laid the groundwork for their reputation as shock troopers. Mostly, the troops of the Canadian Corps were known for their savage raids on enemy trenches and their unwritten take no prisoner and kill the wounded policies. Locked in a stalemate in opposing oh. trenches, the Canadians devised all manner of strategy- Okay, take no prisoner I can get. Kill the wounded? Hey, hey. Good lord. That's a different level. Like, you, you're you supposed to... You're supposed to take... You, you, well, prisoners of war and stuff like that. That's, that's normally what happens to a lot of the people that are injured. But, my god, kill the wounded? ...geez and weaponry to flip the chessboard upside down and clean up the enemy pieces. Cutting through barbed wire, they crept upon them in the cover of night with painted faces, launching either savage, unforeshadowed raids, or perking up their ears and eavesdropping on enemy plans. In said raids, the Canadians gorged their bayonets with blood and made good use of improvised melee weapons, paying little attention to attempts at surrender and skewering bandaged and unarmed men just the same as men on their feet with rifles. They even concocted an alchemist shelf of homebrew explosives, like pipe bombs and jam jars loaded with nails and gunpowder. I so, anarchist cookbook before the anarchist cookbook. That's what they, that was their uh, playbook. They, they made their own. I think it's a safe bet to say that at least one grenade is made with a maple syrup jar. There are also tales of Canadian troops using temporary truces, like on Christmas Day, as a chance to catch their enemy with his stockings on, sending him grenades instead of Christmas ham, and bullets through the brain instead of season's greetings. Now, it could be argued that Canadians were acting out of vengeance, but couldn't that argument be used to justify most atrocities in most wars? Canadian Lieutenant R.C. Germain's letter home to his parents makes the revenge excuse about as clear as the sap from a freshly tapped maple tree. After losing half of my company there, we rushed them, and they had the nerve to throw up their hands and cry kamarad. All the kamarad they got was a foot of cold steel, while I blew their brains out with my revolver. Great God. Despite being a little stab happy with enemy I mean, soldiers, Canadian troops yeah, were known for being quiet, you know. as we contemporary folk have come to expect, polite to civilian populations. Before we have a look at Canadian reputation in World War II and some of its stories, it might pay to know about Canada's involvement in the war. Canada waited until the 10th of September 1939 to declare war in Germany because it didn't want to follow Britain like a Commonwealth sheep. It took Canada until the 11th of June 1940 to declare war on Italy and the 7th of December 1941 to declare it on Japan. Overall, about 10% of Canada's population fought for her and the Allies. 
This amounted to around 1,100,000 Canadians serving in the Canadian Army, the Royal Canadian Navy, Damn. and the Royal Canadian Air Force. Of this 1,100,000, the majority were volunteers. Canadians fought in almost every theater of World War II, notably in the defense of the United Kingdom, the Battle of Hong Kong, the Dieppe Parade, the invasions of Sicily and Italy, the Normandy landings and the liberation of France, and the liberation of Belgium and the Netherlands. The Canadian Navy escorted Allied ships across the Atlantic and maintained a high presence in the Pacific Ocean, and pilots from the Canadian Air Force flew under the wing of the British Royal Air Force. German submarines sunk Canadian naval and merchant vessels in the water of Canada and Newfoundland and attacked the loading pier at Bell Island. And the Japanese also attacked a lighthouse on Vancouver Island, though little else occurred in Canadian waters or on mainland Canada. Of the military operations in which Canadians were involved, their ferocity and inventiveness stood out in the Battle of Ortona, the Normandy landings and the liberation of Belgium and the Netherlands. Through the medieval streets of Ortona, Italy, the Canadians and Germans engaged in brutal room-to-room, hand-to-hand fighting, with the Germans eventually having to withdraw. Here, the Canadians coined the tactic mouse holding, which is basically blowing holes in buildings to allow the passage of infantry rather than running into enemy bullets in the open. In the D-Day landings, the Canadians landed on Juno Beach. So instead of you instead of charging into somewhere where people are holed up to, to fight them hand to hand just blow a hole into the side of the place and then your people can go through i mean it's a legit strategy and i can see the reason why you do it you lose fewer people probably doing it that way but holy crap imagine being on the other side of that wall when you blow the hole out oh i would not want to be in that position each the second most resisted beachhead besides omaha the Canadians penetrated further inland than anyone else, coming up against some of the strongest units in the German military. In Belgium and the Netherlands, the Canadians spent thousands and thousands of Canadian lives to drive the Germans back and get food to the starving civilian populations. They even shared rations with civilians and gave them blankets. Some of the most intense combat here was in the Battle of Scheldt where the Allies fought through flooded terrain against stiff German defences for about a month. This battle alone cost the Canadians more than 6,000 casualties. This latter triumph, particularly the part about getting food to the starving civilians, is certainly keeping with Canadian tendencies in the First World War, though the following atrocity paints a bit of a different picture. Canadian Lieutenant Colonel Frederick E. Wiggle was shot dead on approach to the town of Friesoite, Germany, and a rumor spread that it was a civilian sniper from that town who shot him. Back on that revenge train, the Canadians burnt down the entire town, apparently moving its citizens onward before setting their homes on fire. It was discovered later that Wiggle was shot by German soldiers. Now- Holy So- <laughs> Yo, all right. Yeah, the revenge narrative is strong in these ones. Holy, holy cow, dude. That's, oh, so a civilian sniper took out one of our soldiers. Burn it to the ground. That's, I mean, I could, it seems like you'd be like, all right, give me the sniper so we can, you know, do with him, you know, we, we could kill him ourselves, but burn the place to the ground and then find out that it's, German military. I mean, it's war, so things happen. Oh, the intent of emphasizing Canadian brutality in World War I and mentioning the Friesoite incident is not to take away from Canadian bravery in either world conflict. Like I said before, Canadians were some of the most well-trained and formidable soldiers on any front in any war. And I think the best way to communicate that is to share some stories involving some of the most heroic Canadian soldiers in World War II. On the 14th of December 1943, Canadian Captain Paul Tricot and his company, supported by an armoured squadron, tried to cross the gully and take the Casa Baradi, a hamlet on the Orto Orsona lateral, Italy. Under heavy machine gun and mortar fire, Tricot ran around organising and inspiring what remained of his men, saying, There are enemy in front of us, behind us and on our flanks. There is only one safe place. That is on the objective before charging forward and breaking through the enemy line. Tricot's company and the supporting tank squadron 
pushed right up to the edge of Casa Barari, where he set up defenses and fought off a tank supported German counterattack with whatever Bro, weapons he could find. He I'm held the defensive primary against inspire. superior numbers until the rest of the battalion came in and relieved the company. Trikez's utter disregard of danger, his cheerfulness and tireless devotion inspired his men and his tactical skill and leadership facilitated the capture at a vital point on the Ortona Rosona lateral. On the 18th of August 1944, Canadian Major David Vivian Curry was in command of a force of tanks, self-propelled anti-tank guns and infantry. His task was to block an escape route from the Falaise pocket in the village of Solembeur sur Diver, Normandy. Curry went in alone to- I'm glad this person can pronounce all these names because... Yeah, I... pronunciation is not my strong point, that's for sure. Most Canadians are known to, you know, the stereotype is they're friendly and they can be quite smug. And it's not like I haven't known a Canadian or two or three and had conversations with them and stuff like that. But yeah, generally friendly. They can be a little bit smug. You know, it's just easy, you know, peaceable folks and stuff like that. But holy Jesus, a whole different side whenever, of course, I mean, that's kind of true for everybody, but it's not. You're not getting the picture painted of, of Canadians that you would associate with them under the guidelines of war. It, it's... Man. To scout German defenses and to free the crew of two Allied tanks which were previously disabled. Under heavy mortar fire, he succeeded. The Germans then kept throwing counterattacks at Korean his men until, on the 20th, one final German counterattack was thwarted by Curry, costing the Germans some 2,900 casualties. Throughout these three days of intense combat, Curry displayed gallant conduct and a contempt of danger and collected and inspired his men. One of his officers said, we knew at one stage that it was going to be a fight to the finish, but he was so cool about it, it was impossible for us to get excited. Over the three days... See, that... But and that's the type of leadership you need in situations like that, though. Having a cool, calm, collected manner, you know, a demeanor about you keeps everybody from... Because that's when you... Any point in time you get overly excited or you get overly amped and stuff like that, mistakes can be made. And, uh, that's that's the type of leadership you definitely need. Somebody that, that can keep everybody at that even kill to uh, prevent unnecessary mistakes and deaths from happening. Days, Curry barely got an hour's sleep. And when it was over, he fell asleep standing and then crashed to the ground. Curry's courage and devotion to duty had a far-reaching effect on the successful outcome of the battle. French-Canadian Corporal Leo Major was also in Normandy where he captured a German armoured vehicle which held secret codes and lost an eye to a phosphorus grenade. He stayed in service, saying that he looked like a pirate. However, it wasn't in Normandy where Leo earned his first Distinguished Conduct Medal, but in the Netherlands in 1945. Actually, before we go there, Leo single-handedly captured 93 Germans in the Battle of Schell, when out on a solo oh. reconnaissance mission in 1944. I'm not mistaken, I've done, I've reacted to a, a, a thing on this cat right here. He escorted all 93 of them back to his camp, where he would not accept a DCM because he considered the person awarding it to him to be incompetent. Back to 1945 and the real DCM. After breaking his back, ribs and both ankles when the car he was in was hit by a landmine, Leo went on a what? recon mission with a friend in the city of Zwolle. His friend was yeah. killed, so Major continued alone, capturing a German soldier, making the soldier take him to his officer, who was in a bar, and then telling that German officer that the Canadian artillery was going to shell and kill them all. Leo then ran through the city, firing his gun and lobbing grenades, fooling the Germans into thinking the Canadian army was invading. All through the night, Major brought captured German troops back to his camp, resting in civilian houses whenever he needed to catch his breath. He then set a Gestapo HQ on fire and assaulted a Nazi SS HQ before meeting with members of the Dutch resistance and informing them that he had liberated the entire city by himself. I've got to say, that last one is pure insanity. What an absolute machine. 
Overall, based on the available evidence at least, I think Canadians in World War II abandoned their unofficial take no prisoner and kill the wounded policies of World War I. Obviously, this is a generalization, and the Frisoite incident certainly demonstrates that they were at least capable of unjust violence. Though, there is no comparing the deeds of the Canadians to, say, the Germans, the Japanese, and the Soviets. As evinced by the stories of Paul Tricot, David Curry, and Leo Major, Canadian courage and formidability was in no short supply, and I believe modern-day Canadians should be proud of how the Canadian military cleaned up their act after World War I and made such a brave and significant contribution to an Allied victory in the Second World War. Anyways, guys, make sure you let me know your thoughts on Canada. That's some pretty outstanding stuff right there. That, that Leo Major, I have reacted to, to a video on him before. That's just mind-boggling that somebody was able to take and actually one person did that and liberated the town by himself. So, after doing a little bit of read-through real quick. Yeah, so apparently uh, <laughs> Geneva Convention um, probably had definitely had Canadians in mind. God, so, I mean, it, like, it, like I said, it, it, there's a lot of you know can, Canadians by and large are seen as fairly nice people, and and it, it, he went kind of overboard with the maple syrup chugging and stuff like that. But generally, you know, nice folks, peaceable people. But you know, the horrors of war. There's no telling what might happen. World War One being different than any war in previous history, like tossing. <laughs> had been, they'd gotten into the habit of tossing, like, tins of food over to the Germans in the trenches. They were, you know, I guess, friendly, and then that's where you're talking about tossing grenades to them, because that happened. Germans were hollering for more and more. They, uh, they tossed grenades over to them. Not very nice or friendly, to be honest with you, but it's war. It's war. Things happen in war. Um, I don't understand the, war in and of itself is inhumane. So whenever inhumane things happen, to call it a war crime, I think is kind of a a need to, and it seems to happen more often than not to ones who are on the losing side, but a need to further retaliate for damages that were done. Horrible stuff happens in war. So the fact that we're trying to, you know, we've got, rules of rules of what you can and can't or what isn't isn't acceptable in war especially by uh i just don't until you're put in that situation i don't think you you know and and see your comrades die or anything i don't i don't think there's anything really that uh could be said or you don't you can't put yourself in that position to know so any kind of brutalization killing of prisoners and things like that or or you know, killing the wounded is, is atrocious and is horrific. It is war. But apparently, you know, the Canadians, <laughs> they're mild-mannered until uh, war comes around. Because, uh, yeah, they did a lot of a lot of the soldiers, a lot of gallantry there through the two, the two world wars especially. So, very interesting video. <laughs> very interesting video, to say the least. Um, very, very cool, though. Very cool. And don't get it twisted. I'm not trying to take and say, you know, oh, did overlook war crimes. I'm not saying that at all. It's just the fact that we as humans, with a depraved nature that we can have, especially during the times of war, and it's not like it's gentleman wars from back in the Middle Ages where there's agreed upon times for military campaigns with the way things happen and the way things go and how protecting your home or trying to get back home, the things that people feel led to do. It's kind of, I don't know, just kind of one of those ironic type things to me, I guess. Uh, that being said, hope you all enjoyed this. Y'all be good to each other. Love yourselves. Peace.